Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tolman. Welcome back to another episode of Talk Dizzy to Me. My name is Danielle Tolman. I am a vestibular physical therapist and as always joined by my co-host, Dr. Abby Ross, a vestibular physical therapist and neuroclinical specialist. Today, we are joined by one of our fan favorites, Jeff Walter, as well as our special guest, an audiologist from Boys Town National Research Hospital, Kristen Janke. Thank you, both of you, for, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right, Kristen, would you mind giving us a little bit of a, a background on yourself, um, who you are, where you work, what you do? And then, Jeff, we'll have you, we'll have you go into your spiel right after that, too, and uh, to reintroduce yourself to our listeners. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, as you said, work at Boystown National Research Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, this year will be my 17th year at Boystown. Um, I started here while I was writing my Ph.D. dissertation. And my primary job when I started was to run the clinical portion of the vestibular clinic. And then after I finished, then my job was to initiate a research lab at Boys Town um, doing, you know, research in human subjects. So uh, when I finished my PhD, I kind of panicked and thought, I don't know how to run a research lab. What do I do? So I left for a year and went to Hopkins and did a postdoc there for a year and collected data. And then felt like I had a little bit more experience under my belt and came home. And um, then my position was 50% in the clinic and 50% in research. And as the years have gone by, my clinic role has gone down and my research has gone up. And so I have a, um, a grant right now where I am required to be in research 75%. And so I'm only in clinic 15% of my week and everything's in percentages. Um, so I see patients about one morning and a half a week um, and that will span for five years. And then when this grant is up, I'll go back to seeing um, patients a little bit more. Um, but our uh, patient mix at Boys Town is about 50% adults, 50% kids. And I would say that in terms of my patient load, it's about 75% kids and 25% adults. So a little bit different than what is typically seen. Great. Uh, I've heard Kristen speak that conferences before and she always gives very educational presentations and I've always appreciated them. So we're very happy to have her here on this podcast. Uh, my name's Jeff Walter. I'm a physical therapist in central Pennsylvania. I have an interest in teaching, do some research, but primarily in the clinic daily. Um, and I head up our balance center at Geisinger Medical Center um, in central Pennsylvania. I also do some teaching and uh, you can find my courses at primarily MedBridge education for online education, and I do some live courses throughout the year. We are lucky to have both of you on today. Now, Jeff, um, you prompted me to make sure I talked to Kristen at the Charleston uh, Update Research co uh, Conference that was put on by um, MUSC up in Charleston, and it was absolutely amazing. You're 100% correct in the fact that she puts on the most amazing educational talks, blew my mind, and even got me a little interested in the pediatric side of uh, vestibular therapy. So we're really excited to have you here today. And um, Jeff, why don't you uh, take it away with some of your awesome questions sure. that you had uh, put together for us? I like Kristen, but she's going to have to have, do some work to get me interested in pediatric. <laughs> but we'll continue on anyhow. Um, I'll see what I can do. All right. Uh, can you review the basics of it? So we want to talk about audiometric testing, especially as it relates to patients with dizziness. Could you talk about an audiogram and how it's performed and what we glean from it when it's uh, performed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so typically as part of our battery, we require or really like um, more the majority of our patients have had an audiometric test before we, or as part of our assessment <clears throat> workup for anybody who's having problems with dizziness. Um, but if you go in for a hearing test, you're going to be seated in a soundproof booth and um, you're going to hear sounds that are played at different frequencies or different pitches. So typically we think about it as like a piano going from low pitch to high pitch. And we want to know how patients hear at different frequencies or pitches because it can vary depending on what's going on in the ear. So a tone is typically played and you, you know, as you consider or as you kind of think about it, um, you raise your hand when you hear the beep and then the sound is made lower and lower. And we're looking for what's called threshold, which is the softest sound that you can hear 50% of the time. 
And so we look at how well you can see at each of those pitches or frequencies. <clears throat> and we look for a couple of different things. One, we look to see are you with in, within what's considered a normal range. And if you are, fantastic. And if you're not, we look at the configuration um, of what your hearing loss looks like. And that can vary. So some people can hear normal and low pitches and not normal or have some hearing loss just in the higher pitches or vice versa. You can have hearing loss in the lower pitches that can be you know, completely normal in the highs. <clears throat> Um, the second thing we'll look at is we test your hearing in two different ways. So one, we want to know how you hear when we put a sound into the ear canal, you know, where we are moving the eardrum that's moving through that middle ear space and stimulating what's called the inner ear. Or patients can wear a bone oscillator on the mastoid process, which is just that hard bone right behind your ear. And we um, apply sounds that way. And when we do that, that bypasses that middle ear space and stimulates the inner ear directly. So the benefit of doing that is it lets us know, one, we, what we want is we, we want you to be hearing the same whether we put the sound you know, through the ear canal or behind the ear. But for patients who have something blocking sound from getting in the ear, so say you have wax or you have a hole in your eardrum or those you know, three little bones in the middle ear, maybe one of them has a fracture in them or it has become what we call disarticulated so they're not connected. Um, then that can disrupt the way sound gets in there. And then we'll see a difference in the way you hear via, you know, when sound goes um, through the ear versus when you're stimulated behind the ear. So, um, so the things we learn are, is your hearing normal? If you do have a hearing loss, you know, what is the configuration or shape of that hearing loss? And then are you hearing the same when we um, allow sound to go through the middle ear versus when we bypass the middle ear? So that tells us if there are um, sort of where the breakdown occurs in terms of your hearing. Of course, this is a show on vestibular dysfunction and all things vestibular, but you mentioned that you see both adults and children. Who is being referred to you specifically? Is it just patients that you suspect vestibular involvement or anything under the sun? Yeah, so that's a good question. So yes, yeah, so typically for patients who have dizziness, that's going to be an obvious referral. Um, but we also see a lot of children who do not complain of dizziness, <clears throat> but just have hearing loss. So there is an association between hearing loss and vestibular loss in children. Um, and we've done some work on this over the years. And um, if you wanted to predict whether a child were to have vestibular loss, we look at their degree of hearing loss. And typically kids who have what are considered severe to profound, so very significant amount of hearing loss, are at increased risk for having vestibular loss. So the rough statistic is that 50% of kids with severe to profound hearing loss have some degree of vestibular loss. And of those, 50% have bilateral vestibular loss. So <clears throat> yes, anybody, child or adult who's having dizziness, we like to see and then um, we will typically screen any child who has significant hearing loss, so severe to profound, or kids who have vestibular loss will have delays in gross motor function. So if a child who has delays in gross motor function, um, if we wanna know if they have vestibular loss and they'll be referred as well. And typically if that child hasn't had their hearing checked, that's an immediate thing that we do as well. Um, just a couple comments from my perspective. I think an audiogram is if you're seeing a patient with dizziness, I think they should almost always have an audiogram. I think the exception would be if you have a really clear cut case of BPPV and there's no other cochlear related complaints or no other concern about vestibular hypofunction. I think those are patients that could be exempt, but I think it's really important to get a, hear a hearing test. That's a baseline test that most of our patients get at CS Center Balance Center. Yeah. So that's the test with the highest frequency of utilization at our center. Um, can you, uh, you commented on this earlier, but I have patients that come in and they'll say, I was told I have a 42% hearing loss in my right ear. Is hearing loss quantified objectively in that manner? Or how do you quantify hearing yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I have patients will come in and give me some percentage. And I'm like, I am an audiologist and I have no idea what that means. <clears throat> so I believe there's some sort of calculator out there that some people use to quantify degree of hearing loss, but that's not something that we use and not something that I'm familiar with. Um, so typically we will quantify the degree of 
we quantify hearing loss in terms of degree. So mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe, and profound. <clears throat> and again, that can vary based on the pitch or frequency. So some people might have a normal sloping to profound hearing loss, and that tells you that they're normal in the lower pitches and that their hearing falls off fairly dra drastically in the high frequencies. I'm glad you brought that up because one thing that confused me in my novice stage is I would read a report from an audiologist and it would state that the patient's hearing was normal to profound hearing loss. And I'm like, hmm, that's pretty helpful. That kind of covers all spectrums. But <laughs> yeah. for the therapist out there, that first term is, in and correct me if I'm wrong, Kristen, the first term that's used when hearing loss is described is where your hearing is at in your low frequencies. And then the second term you'll hear when it's just described how a patient did on an audiogram is where they're at in their high frequencies. Correct. So when someone has normal to moderate severe sensory neural hearing loss, you can picture in your mind that their hearing is in the normal range in the low frequency and then just slopes down to the point where they have a moderate to severe loss in their high frequencies. Yep, that's exactly right. So it's kind of like reading. So it's just kind of describing. So going from left to right, kind of describing that overall pattern. And for example, this says a, a profound pan frequency hearing loss. That would, that would be a patient who has pretty much a useless ear for hearing across the entire frequency spectrum that's tested on the, audio, on the audiogram. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes people will use the term anacusic if there's no measurable hearing in that ear. Um, I don't know if people use that across the charts, but we do see that frequently. We'll say that's an anacusic ear, yeah. Um, one other thing with audiograms, can you mention, so you're measuring a patient's awareness of sound. Do you measure how well a patient understands what they hear? Yes. So you can do what's called speech testing. And so there are a couple of different ways to do that. One is to look for their threshold. So we'll say some words repeatedly and the, that'll go down in intensity. And we look for, again, that threshold that point of where you can detect 50% of what's being heard. <clears throat> and then we go up to a comfortable level and we'll say words and look to see how individuals understand um, words at a comfortable level. And then another test that's picking up speed is understanding how individuals do in the presence of background noise. So are they able to pull out the signal that they you know, need to hear to understand from this other background noise? And some of that can be helpful for counseling patients or just understanding how they're doing in everyday activities. Because we live in a noisy world, most patients that have hearing loss when they come in for a visit will say, well, I, hear, I do fine hearing you now because we're in this really quiet exam room. But when I go out to eat or I'm you know, out and about in, a, in the shopping center, that's where I really struggle. And that's because there's a lot of other background noise. So um, I know routinely individuals are starting to test what's happening in background noise to get a better sense for sort of real world um, application. I'll say from the clinic side of things, I'm not a, a attached to um, a, a hospital or a clinic that has audiological testing. However, I routinely and constantly remind my patients that one, you don't know what you can't hear because you can't hear it. And then two, having your hearing tested regularly, especially in just my, my aging patients is really important. Um, and I, tr I do take the time to educate patients about the importance of using hearing aids sooner rather than later if they're recommended, why it's recommended, how it can help bolster spatial awareness, as well as um, a lot of the research coming out showing that you can slow down cognitive decline and possibly dementia later on in life, not missing out on quality time with friends and family and enjoying time being out and about. So on the clinician side of things, even if you don't have um, any sort of involvement with your local um, audiological testing, I still encourage patients, and I think that other clinicians too, should, to get their hearing tested regularly and to touch base with those people in your community because there's a lot of overlap on what you do with a patient versus um, what they're being tested for. And it's a really meaningful relationship to work together with um, audiology in that sense. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, you may not have somebody in your house in house with you, but to find a local person to refer out is, would be highly recommended. And you're exactly right of all of the things. So, you know, having hearing loss can contribute to senses of isolation, increased depression, increased anxiety. And when we think about the things that we're targeting in PT, 
we can see similar things happen when patients become more sedentary and they're not moving and they can have, you know, more depression and anxiety and it can kind of spiral. And so I think part of the um, habilitation or rehabilitation process can be looking at, you know, all different angles of things that are feeding into someone's overall general well-being. I just wanted to mention, so the way you can think about it for the therapists that are tuning in is when you look at an um, audiometric testing, at the top of the, if you get a printout of the report, at the top, you're test, they're testing your sound awareness. And then at the bottom, you'll see speech word recognition scores, which is telling you how well the patient's actually understanding what they hear. Numerous times I've seen patients that have pretty equal sound awareness in each ear. In other words, when you look at their pure tones, just their ability to recognize sound in each ear, it's symmetric but you go down to their word recognition scores and it's very poor in one ear. That's actually concerning for retrocochlear pathology. And we can see that with vestibular schwannoma. So that's one thing we're always looking for. I can remember just like a year ago, I saw a patient who didn't complain of hearing loss at all. And we got a hearing test done and their pure tones were fine, but their ability to understand speech and their one ear was substantially diminished. And it was the same side they had findings of vestibular hypofunction and actually turned out to have a schwannoma. So don't just look at the pure tones at the, at the top and look for symmetry and be done. We always look at those word recognition scores because that's telling you how well the, the patient's unable to use what they're hearing. And an a, um, indication, again, for retrocochlear pathology, vestibular schwannoma is specifically a poor ability to make use of what you're hearing. Did I, does that sound reasonable to you, Kristen? Yes, that sounds reasonable to me. Yes, that was a good description. <clears throat> yeah. So, and typically in those, you know, there are a couple things we want to look for in those retrocochlear pathologies. You know, those are so slow growing that um, oftentimes those patients don't necessarily have a um, significant history of dizziness that um, coincides with, you know, some significant vestibular loss. And so, yes, those are all things that we look for. So what does our case history tell us? Do they have significant vestibular loss? And then looking at their audiogram for, you know, asymmetries in hearing. If there's a vestibular schwannoma, we can see some asymmetric hearing where hearing is better in one ear and it would be poor in the ear with a vestibular schwannoma. And then, yes, looking at that word recognition ability. Um, can you speak to some normal changes you see in hearing with age and then contrast that to what you see with sound exposure? Because those are two really common reasons why patients have hearing loss is mat excessive maturity or exposure to sound. And what's what would be some differences you would see in their audiometric patterns? Yeah, so that's a good question. So one of the number one things we'll see um, is what's called presbycusis, and that is just age-related hearing loss. So the typical configuration of hearing with age-related hearing loss is going to be normal um, hearing sensitivity in the lower frequencies or pitches, and then hearing will roll off or decrease in the higher frequencies. Um, and the number one complaint typically for individuals who have presbycusis is difficulty hearing and background noise. So background noise tends to be more low-pitched noise where their hearing is good. And what gives speech its clarity is high frequency information. So if we think about, you know, certain sounds like S's and T's in our speech, and those can get lost in, um, in background noise. So individuals will oftentimes say, gosh, I feel fine. Like I said, it was here and quiet, but the second there's any noise, I lose clarity of speech. And that's typically why um, now, for individuals who have noise-induced hearing loss, the configuration looks roughly the same, where the hearing is typically normal in the lower frequencies, and then we start to see a decline in the high frequencies, except for there's what we call a noise notch. And so, typically between about three and 6,000 hertz, you'll see hearing be at its worst, and then it rises back up, not necessarily to normal, but we do see an increase or an improvement in hearing um, at 8,000 hertz. And that can vary. So that can be in one ear, both ears, depending on the patient's um, noise exposure. And then the degree of that loss can vary depending on the duration of that noise exposure, how loud that noise was. And then in some people, there's just an individual predisposition to have noise-induced hearing loss. 
um, where some people are just more sensitive to, um, to noise. So in those patients, when we see that configuration, we're asking about, uh, about their history. But then, you know, probably more importantly is once you diagnose that is teaching people how to protect what hearing they do have so that that doesn't um, become worse. And so having conversations with individuals about using, you know, earplugs when they're doing, you know, recreational type things like, you know, going to shooting range, ranges or concerts and so on and so forth. Can you touch on that a little bit, especially working in peds, you know, you go to games or shows or sometimes even restaurants, you see kids with their hearing protected. What are your recommendations to parents? Um, you know, that's a good question. And um, that's not a conversation that I have a lot with parents about um, noise exposure. Um, but, you know, typically the recommendation is that if you're going to be around sound that is louder than a hairdryer, for more than eight hours, you need to wear hearing protection. Um, I haven't done a lot of, you know, studying on noise-induced hearing loss in kids and predispositions for children, you know, as they're going through the developmental processes to know if those rules are different or the same for children. Um, <clears throat> but I think probably one of the more, one of the things that comes up more frequently than being at concerts or loud events is counseling families on making sure that headphones are not turned up too loud for kids. And I would say that that's probably something that we talk a little bit more about than, you know, than other types of recreational noise for kids. Um, and there are some systems that are limited, so they can't be turned up too long, but, you know, other things are just limiting the amount of time that kids are wearing them. Um, we've also seen kids who will come in with infections in the ear because they've just been wearing them so much. Um, and so then counseling them on not wearing the in the ear ones, but wearing, you know, overall headphones. So we're not having, you know, infected ear canals. I always tell my son that if he cannot hear me when he has his headphones on, he can't hear what I'm saying to him. They're too loud. <laughs> They're too loud. That's a that's a good rule of thumb. My kids are three and five, so we're not quite there yet in terms uh -huh. of... Uh, well, he's 15 and I get blowback. Um, <laughs> very good. Uh, is there a disease-related pattern that's specific for vestibular schwannoma with hearing loss? Uh, with hearing loss? You know, it depends. So the um, so typically we'll see high-frequency hearing loss with individuals with vestibular schwannoma, but it can be kind of any sort of pattern. Um, and it depends on the size of the schwannoma, where it has started, what part of the, you know, nerve it has encroached. So there is, but there's not sort of this, you know, set pattern. And as you had said, you'll see some patients and they don't have any hearing loss because it has affected more of the vestibular portion right. of that nerve. So I think the most common thing we would see, and like I, I would totally agree, it's just variable, but probably the most common thing we see is poor, poor word recognition scores on the involved side. If we see anything, that's the most yeah. common thing we see. Is there any specific, I'm just going through diseases that we see where a patient would also have dizziness with superior canal dehiscence, is there a particular audiometric pattern to look for? Yeah, so for those patients, we will typically see what's called a conductive hearing loss. And this is an interesting type of patient because just to kind of back up a little bit, we had talked about the difference in measuring hearing when it moves through that middle ear space versus when you put the sound on that mastoid process. So when you see a difference in the way you're hearing versus when it goes through the ear and when you're measuring behind the ear, that's called a conductive hearing loss. Now, nine times out of 10, that conductive hearing loss means that something is keeping sound from getting into the inner ear. Wax in the ear, a hole in the eardrum, you know, someone who has an active middle ear um, infection. But for Dehiscence syndrome, that's different. So we will see a conductive hearing loss in these patients, but the middle ear and the outer ear are completely healthy. The eardrum is intact. I mean, you know, in a hypothetical case. Um, but what happens with them is that they have this opening in the inner ear where when we put sound into the ear canal and it moves through the system, it is being shunted away. And when we measure the hearing via the mastoid, it's getting enhanced to do that opening. So we call that a third window disorder um, or conductive hearing loss of inner ear origin. Um, and so the typical configuration of hearing is that when you measure hearing behind the ear, it's enhanced and looks really good. And when you, you know, measure 
hearing using our you know traditional headphones or earphones um, that they do demonstrate a, um, a what's considered a conductive hearing loss. Good. The way that I kind of remember that is when you have superior canal dehiscence, your ear due to the third window that you have has become an amplifier to any internally generated sounds, but yet has diminished hearing to the outside world. So you can hear you know, vibratory forces traveling through bone exceptionally well, because those are sounds happening inside your body, but yet you have this decreased sensitivity to auditory stimuli from your outside world. Um, so, right, that's one thing we look for. The audiogram is really important for identifying superior canal dehiscence because that's an unusual um, audiometric abnormality to demonstrate. Um, in subjects with Meniere's disease, what do we look for, Kristen? Um, and typically what we'll see is hearing that's poor in the lower pitches that rises to normal in the higher pitches. And that's a very characteristic configuration of hearing loss that we just don't see very often. What does that look like for somebody who's just starting into Meniere, the, the initial phases of Meniere's disease? Do, is that more apparent in the beginning? Does that change? Um, what does that look like? Yeah, so that's a good question. And there isn't this like predictable pattern. I mean, if we took a characteristic textbook patient with Meniere's disease, then typically what we'd see is a slow and steady decline in hearing with a rise back to normal um, <clears throat> over time. And then, you know, initially we'll start out as a low frequency hearing loss that maybe is in the mild range and rises to normal. And then over time, as the Meniere's progresses, we see the severity of that hearing loss drop out. And then you no longer see that rise in the high frequencies, which you can see that sort of fall. And then they kind of have a flat, you know, once we get into the severe range. Um, unfortunately, there isn't this like great prediction of what's going to happen on the cochlear side. So you can have someone have a couple Meniere's attacks and boom, have this severe hearing loss. Other people have this really slow progression. Um, so there isn't, um, I think, one set pattern for everyone. But, you know, I would say more often than not, we do sort of see this slow progression. And, you know, as we know, in order to get a true diagnosis of Meniere's disease, we do have to see hearing loss documented that recovers um, following the attack in order to you know, truly be diagnosed with Meniere's. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there who get a diagnosis of Meniere's based on the configuration of hearing loss because it's hard to get in to see somebody to have your hearing checked when you have an episode. And um, you know, That's going to be my question is how frequently <laughs> are you able to get an audiogram on somebody going through a Meniere's episode because a lot of times one they're feeling so awful, they don't even want to move or come in. But um, has there been times that you've been able to get an audiogram on a patient in the middle of a Meniere's episode? And what does that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I don't work in the um, audiology clinic on the hearing side. So I don't see those patients. I don't know how often they're calling, but we do encourage them to call same day. You know, and part of that is being established somewhere. Um, so that's typically why when patients are having symptoms, we try to get them established with us. So we know when they call same day, why they're calling and that we do need to get them in immediately. Um, I'm, I know we've seen a handful of patients where we have seen them come in and hearing is more severe. And then we have them come back like a week later when they're feeling just fine and hearing has recovered. Um, and that hearing loss can be present just the day of the attack or can persist for a few days. So patients don't necessarily need to come in the day they're feeling absolutely miserable. Um, but we do like them to come in as close to that event as possible so we can document that shift in hearing. Right. So in summary there, the hearing loss with Meniere should be typically a sensory neural, not a conductive loss. And it should be concentrated more in the low frequencies and tends to... Wax and wane, but it's on its way down over time, typically. Yes. Um, hey guys, it's Abby here. Unclench your jaw, relax your shoulders, take a nice deep breath. Doesn't that feel better? Thank you so much for listening to Talk Dizzy to Me. One of our missions here at Balancing Act Rehab is to spread awareness about vestibular dysfunction. And the best way to do that is with your help. 
we'd be so grateful if you took a moment to subscribe, review, and share our show with someone you think would benefit from hearing our conversations. Let's get back to it. Do you have any bedside tests of auditory function that you would recommend for, say, physical therapists that they can perform at bedside to get a screen of a patient's hearing ability? Um, that's a good question. I So I tried to look to see if anybody has done... I didn't look very hard, so I apologize. If there had been any like studies done on the effectiveness of any bedside tests, because um, there isn't anything that we do. Um, you know, you can do a finger rub test or you can do a tuning fork test, but I don't, to be honest, know how effective those are. I feel like what's probably more effective is to talk to patients about whether or not their hearing has been checked in a while and if they're having any other auditory associations with their dizziness. And if they are, if they're having any increased ringing, pressure, fullness, or just a notable change in hearing, then they automatically should just have their hearing checked. And I would say if they haven't had their hearing checked in several years, and even if they're having dizziness but don't report any audio, um, auditory associations, it's still a good good idea. And Danielle, you had said this too, to just get a baseline assessment of where they are <clears throat> because hearing loss can occur very gradually over time where patients may not notice that they even have a change <clears throat> or often married couples will say, Oh, I thought he just developed selective hearing and he's not listening to me anymore. You know, and really they've developed hearing loss over time. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer to your question. Um, there isn't anything that we typically recommend. I think it's also hard because I work in an audiological setting where we're not using those types of screenings and we are just testing everyone. Right. Jeff, is there anything that you do? Because in your unique setup, you have um, your branch of things in the, in the physical therapy bedside testing, but you also have an otolaryngologist right down the hall. You've got audiogram, the um, audiology right across the, the hall too. Is there anything that you do at bedside to kind of give you an inclination whether or not you should send them across the hall? Yeah, I have a lot to say. <laughs> so one is I, a finger rub. Actually, it's been measured. It's usually the typical finger rub is a, about a fourth, a fourth uh, kilohertz frequency stimuli, and it's about 30 decibels. Most patients that cannot hear a finger rub in their ear have a high frequency hearing loss, and I found that to correlate pretty well. In other words, if I check a patient to see if finger rubs intact and it's not, they almost always have a high frequency hearing loss on their audio. Um, so I do find just a finger rub at bedside is one crude way to check their hearing in the higher frequency. So in my note, I'll just put hearing, uh, hearing intact to finger rub bilaterally or hearing absent to finger rub bilaterally. You can compare the two sides. Um, I do Weber testing, which is putting a 512 hertz fork in the midline of the patient's forehead. I have found that test to be, I would, if a patient tells you it's lateralizing to one ear, go do some other test with them and then come back and repeat it again because the intertrial reliability, I suspect, is not strong. But now if a patient, you know, two or three times in a row, spaced out by time, keeps telling you it's going to one ear, then I believe it more. So you can check to see if a Weber test, which is just taking the stem of a tuning fork, you vibrate it, you put it on the middle of your patient's uh, forehead, and if they feel like it attenuates to one ear, it either can imply they have a conductive loss in that ear or a sensory neural hearing loss on the opposite side. So you can kind of piece together what that would mean. Um, I sometimes do Rene testing. So that's seeing if a tuning fork is louder when you place it in the front of the patient's ear, or if they hear it better when you place it behind their ear. Patients with a conductive hearing loss, for example, superior canal dehiscence, they often appreciate it more when you put the stem behind their ear and not in the front. Normally, you should hear a tuning fork that's in front of your ear better than behind your ear. Is the stem of that on the mastoid to yeah. kind of do the bone conduction? So it's not like it's in free floating behind the ear. It's you're putting the tuning fork on the, the stem mastoid. Of the fork goes on the mastoid and then the uh, opposite end of the fork is just in front of their ear. And you're just comparing which sounds louder to the patient. So I found that helpful for that purpose. And I've recently fell in love with testing recruitment. So I don't think we've talked about this on the podcast before, but when I have a patient who I suspect may have Meniere's, I find this to be really helpful. So follow along here. It's a little confusing. 
if you take a tuning fork and you just really lightly tap it and you compare it, well, just how well do you hear that in your left ear compared to your right? If a patient has a sensory neural hearing loss and you just tap the fork very lightly, they'll usually tell you it's diminished on their affected side. Then repeat the test, but take the fork and now you bang it pretty loud and you put it up to their ear. And a lot of patients with Meniere's disease demonstrate recruitment, which is now they'll look at you weird and they'll be like, well, now it's louder in my diseased ear on the side I thought I had hearing loss on. In fact, they're afraid to tell you sometimes because they'll think that isn't right, but I hear it better now in my diseased ear. So that's called recruitment. And I think it's pretty common in, in a patient with high drops uh, with, with Meniere's disease. So I've been doing recruitment testing at bedside lately too. But like Kristen said, when you're an, when you're an audiologist and you have all the testing at your fingertips, they, I definitely trust the objective audiometric testing more. But these are some bedside tests, especially for like a home care therapist, or if you don't have access to um, the test Kristen has been talking about are at least gives you some insight into what may be going on with the patient. I think it's also good for patient buy-in, right? So here I am telling the patient, like, listen, if you're having some of these issues and, and you know, I really think you should go get your hearing tested, if you can give them a couple of tests where they can see that there's a difference or they can at least kind of understand where you're coming from, you might get more buy-in from that patient. So like I have a whole spiel where I go into all of this and I try to demonstrate and I have a video of what it looks like with somebody balancing with hearing aids on and hearing aids off. And by the end of it, I can convince them to, to go talk to their doctor and get a, an audiogram. But I think that doing those bedside tests is just, again, having that patient realize what you're doing, why you're doing it, and buying into that. Another helpful for the um, telehealth therapist is um, if you want to check, if you just want to crudely get it, if a patient over the phone is telling you that they have hearing loss in their left ear, what you can ask the patient to do is hum to themselves. Um, and if you have a conductive loss, like if you shove your tragus, which is this hunk of cartilage outside your ear canal, and you shove it back your ear canal and you hum to yourself, you have a conductive hearing loss, you'll perceive that the humming's going to the ear you're occluding. If you have a sensory neural hearing loss, which is frankly kind of more concerning, um, when a patient hums to themselves, it'll go to their good ear. So you can do the hum test, which is just asking a patient to hum to themselves and see if it lateralizes to the ear their hearing's diminished in, think conductive loss. If they hum and it goes to what is their good ear, they probably have a sensory neural hearing loss. So it's a quick little, it's almost like a, a Weber test, except you're just asking the patient to provide the uh, stimuli via humming instead of a tuning fork. So an, an ENT taught me that a while ago and I found that to be helpful. Again, as a screen, these are all screens. <laughs> so. Now, Kristen, uh, another question for you, your setup and also Jeff's setup are different than probably most people's setup. Let's say you have a patient who presents with one of the configurations you were mentioning before that are associated with certain vestibular presentations. What's your next step with those patients? Um, who are you referring them to thereafter? Yeah, so that's a good question. So most of the patients that we see are being referred from sort of a management, a managing physician. The majority of the patients that we see <clears throat> are being managed by either our neurotologist or one of our ENTs. So if we see somebody who has, you know, a certain configuration of hearing loss, let's say, you know, if it's consistent with dehiscence syndrome, I'm going to send them back to our neurotologist for consultation on you know, how severe their symptoms are. And if they are somebody who's a good, you know, um, candidate for canal plugging or canal resurfacing. Um, if it's a patient who, unrelated to their vestibular disorder, has some presbycusis that's significant and is impairing, impairing their everyday function, I will send them back to one of our audiologists for a hearing aid consultation. Um, so it kind of depends on what they configuration of their hearing losses, what their primary complaints are, and then what the um, underlying etiology of their, you know, hearing losses. For Meniere's disease patients, they'll get um, referred back to their managing physician, potentially for medications to see if, um, like, steroid use can decrease some of that hearing loss. For patients whose hearing loss recovers, great for hearing for patients whose hearing loss, you know, remains, 
then it's questions about whether or not they're in a range where they are amplification candidates and need to be seen for a hearing aid consultation. So some of it just you know varies based on severity of hearing loss and then overall etiology. If you suspect as a therapist that you have pretty good evidence at bedside that your patient's hearing loss has a high probability of being conductive and not sensory neural, really should send that patient to an ENT, preferably an otologist or neurotologist to have that looked at. There, you don't want to get your patient's hopes up too high, but there are causes of conductive hearing loss that are surgically amenable um, and they should be that should be ruled out that there's nothing surgically that can be done versus just sending them to go get hearing aids. Um, you know, if your patient just has a, what seems like an age related symmetric loss that's just gradually accumulated over time, probably referral just directly to an audiologist would be appropriate. But if you, if it's asymmetric with the hearing loss, or you think it may be conductive, those are reasons why I think you'd want to refer to the physician first. Yeah. And I would say like if patients are having dizziness and that's why you're seeing them, we always like them to see a physician um, prior to um, getting hearing aids just to make sure everything checks out. Okay. And, you know, and we're kind of lucky in that we're in this setting where our referrals are all coming from ENT. So we're not really worried about it. So, you know, kind of taking a step back and thinking about, okay, well, if I was a freestanding clinic, what would I want? And I always kind of tend to think like, if this was my dad or this was my mom or my sister, like, how would I want that handled? And typically we like them to see um, a physician to rule out, you know, anything that might need actual medical care prior to, you know, moving on to hearing aids to treat that hearing loss. I'll say that um, I've, I've practiced in multiple settings now in multiple states because I keep seeing to seeming to move down the coast, the East Coast here. But, um, you know, it it's challenging being a clinician that sometimes is the the first person that they're seeing because it's a refer referral from a primary care physician. They haven't seen a neurologist. They haven't seen an ENT because they're backed up. Um, but this is where, I mean, if you haven't gotten the gist of from our talk already, this is where you need to build up a team of a multidisciplinary approach. You should have some an idea of who somebody can go to because if you're making these recommendations to your patients, you're finding this at bedside, you need to offer them, hey, I know this person does work with dizzy patients. You should go talk to them. Or if they say, well, I've already talked to my doctor and you say, you kind of have to tell them, well, if you in your gut feel like that that question that you have, you know, what's causing this isn't answered, you need to get a second opinion. You need to see a physician. And there are plenty of times where I've told the patient it's not appropriate for us to do physical therapy at this time and that you need to get cleared for X, Y, and Z first before we can jump into this. And patients are usually very appreciative and amenable to that. But make sure um, you have a, a network of people that you can refer to or um, at least uh, discuss this with in your area to make sure you're doing right by your patient. Okay, we'll give you one more question, then we'll cut you free because we're already at about 45 minutes here. Um, but this is good. Um, do you think it's important to perform otoscopic examination on patients with dizziness? And if so, what are you looking for? Yeah, so that's a good question. You know, when we think about the um, etiologies we've talked about so far, the Hisson syndrome, we haven't talked about vestibular migraine, but, you know, just list one, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis, you know, when we look in the ear, they're not going to, that's not going to provide us with that diagnosis. But oftentimes I'm looking in the ear for factors that can affect how I'm going to interpret my testing. Um, I would say, you know, I've been doing this for 16 plus years and granted I'm not in clinic every day, but the one thing we kind of look for is does this patient have a cholesteatoma that's, you know, encroaching in the middle ear space, but that's so rare. And I rarely see that. Um, but most of the time I, I'm looking in there to see is, does the ear canal look healthy? Do they have a bunch of wax in there that's going to affect me doing a caloric irrigation? Do they have a hole in their eardrum that's going to affect me doing a caloric irrigation? Or, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about today either is vent testing, and that can be affected by um, a substantial amount of wax being in the ear if it's, you know, plugging the um, earphone in the ear or having a, you know, perforation. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking for when we look in the ear. Um, <clears throat> I've also had patients come in and have, you know, an active otitis event where that's also causing them pain and that needs to be um, treated by a physician. 
I would say that's more of a rarity that I look in there and see an actual abnormality, but you just never know. Um, so we always look in the ears prior to doing, you know, any, any sort of testing and then to look for that um, one in a hundred case where what you see in the, you know, ear canals explaining patient symptoms. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. Just some additional comments. Um, if you're seeing a patient and they have signs of hypofunction in the ear, so they have signs of right vestibular hypofunction, and they're complaining of reduced hearing in that ear, and if you do, if you get comfortable with doing otoscopic exam, and you see what looks like cerumen pasted on their eardrum, not along the canals, but right on the drum when you do your scope, that needs to be looked at um, because one cause of that is what Kristen mentioned, which is called cholesteatoma, which is a really confusing term. Because when you hear the term cholesteatoma, what do you think? The patient has a tumor filled with cholesterol, but it's really, um, it's a dermal based mass that grows from the eardrum in, in towards the midline of your skull and can erode your labyrinth on the way in. You're at risk for one of these if you've had a history of tympanic membrane perforation. Um, in my career, I've found just about 10 of them now in my career, not always related to why the patient's dizzy, but sometimes they are. The way you wanna look, they'll, they'll, they form from the surface of the eardrum and grow in, and it'll look like just sort of like a pearly mass, if you can see some of the mass with debris overlying it and it look, the debris looks like it is glued to the patient's eardrum. So whenever I see cerumen right on a patient's um, tympanic membrane, I really like that cleared out by ENT to make sure that there's nothing underneath it. Now, like Kristen said, you can see that whatever, 50 times and one time it's actually something sinister underneath it, but you don't know till you look because um, I've been surprised by, by the results of that sometimes. I think it's also important to do otoscopic exam to when a patient's there to see you, they want some assurance you've actually looked at their ear. <laughs> so I do it for that purpose. And a lot, at least here in central Pennsylvania, a lot of patients are erroneously told that they're dizzy because they have fluid in their middle ear. So a lot of times I have to do it to go through the gymnastics of telling the patient that's not the problem because it rarely is. A, that's rarely a reason why a patient would be dizzy only. So I'm talking about patients that have no ear pain no hearing loss, no discharge from their ear. They have positional vertigo and they went to see a, a primary care PA and they were told, well, there's fluid in your middle ear space. Here's an antibiotic to take. And if that doesn't work, we'll send you to therapy. So you have to often undo the uh, fluid in the middle ear um, misconception that a lot of patients have. So that's another reason why we do an otoscopic exam besides all the re reasons. Kristen mentioned. It's actually one of my pet peeves is patients thinking that they're dizzy only from otitis media. I find you can also have the opposite sometimes where patients will say, well, they looked at my ear and my ear's fine. Not understanding that inner ear exam is very different than otoscopic. Yeah. I had a patient last week that asked me if I could see those crystals with the scope. And I said, uh, yeah, if you want me to get a drill, we can see them. <laughs> Education is key. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Well, we're so appreciative of this conversation today. We can go on and on and on. So, Kristen, if you are ever itching to come back, we would love to have you back on because I have lots of questions about OVEM, CVEMS, otolithic uh, issues, and how we can address that in the clinic. So, if you're up for it, we'd love for a part two at some point. And, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. You're always a fan favorite. Everyone loves when you come on because you always drop all these little uh, golden nuggets of information. We absolutely love it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. I know. I you. learned a lot about bedside testing of audiometric function. So, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the MacGyver of audiologic testing. That's right. <laughs> well, I really you have to know who MacGyver is, anyhow. <laughs> I know who MacGyver is. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to say thank you so much for having me on. And yes, happy to talk about vent testing at some point in time if that was ever of, of interest. Perfect. And thank you, audience, for joining us today. Let us know if you have any questions or what else you want to hear. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition.
The content of this podcast is based on general knowledge and information available up until the recording of this specific episode. Medical knowledge and practices may evolve over time, and new information may emerge that could change the understanding or treatment of vestibular dysfunction. It is important to consult a qualified healthcare professional for the most up-to-date and personalized advice. The information provided in this podcast is meant to complement, not replace, the relationship that exists between a patient and their healthcare provider. It is intended to empower patients with knowledge about vestibular dysfunction and its management, but individual cases may vary and treatment approaches should be tailored to each patient's unique circumstances. By listening to this podcast, you acknowledge and agree to the terms of this medical disclaimer. The organizers, presenters, and creators of this podcast are not liable for any actions or decisions taken by individuals based on the information presented herein. Always consult with a qualified healthcare provider for medical advice and treatment.